even if the script is bad, even if the movie is bad, professional courtesy is a, is a real thing. Like the, your friends and your colleagues put mad long hours into that. What I want to know about is what do people do that reach these like new heights in the industry? What do they do to stand out? He's like, Josh, everybody should start a company and have it fail. I was like, what? <laughs> he's, all, he's like, everybody should have that experience of starting a company and having it fail because that just means the next one you'll start won't fail. Welcome, everybody, to the first episode of the Industry Standards Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Anna Carolina Pereira, and this is your other host. Hi, I'm Joshua Singh, your other co-host. <laughs> We have teamed up to bring you the latest news, trends, and interviews in the creative industry. Thank you so much to today's sponsor, the Ringling College of Art and Design's virtual reality program. You'll be hearing from them somewhere in this podcast. Hey, we should introduce ourselves. We should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you go first. Okay, so my name is Ana Carolina Pereira, or Ana Carolina if you're from Brazil, like I am. I am a 3D technical artist working in games and VR, also kind of a de just developer in general. I think I could make an entire game on my own if anybody else made the animations. I do not like animations um, at all. Sorry, animators <laughs> that may be listening. Um, I'm also a 3D character artist on the side. So what I'm the known for the most on the internet um, is actually just a little side hobby for me, you know, and sometimes some freelance. But yeah, so I kind of have that double career life. I am a streamer. I've been streaming for almost five years now. I stream for um, ZBrush Live, the official like ZBrush, Maxon, it used to be Pixelogic, but now Maxon like channel uh, all the time. I was taught people like thousands of people all over the world how to use ZBrush. I actually made the new Z Classroom videos. So if you search up how to use ZBrush and you go to Z Classroom, it's all me. Nice. It is so cool, by the way, to be able to say like the students and mentees and like people on the internet are like how do i use zbrush and i'm like you should check out the official resource and it's me <laughs> and it's you awesome. yeah so i've i've um you know over time tried to make a name for myself when it comes to like zbrush and character art education i have my own business i've had a business for almost two years now and I, in it i do workshops and mentorships actually for people trying to break into the industry because one of my main interests isn't just the artwork itself it's the mindset and entrepreneur, like entrepreneurial thinking that it takes nowadays to get in. You know, you have to have discipline, you have to have good habits, you have to have the right network, you have to have an online presence, experience, you have to have like all these extreme amounts of things because it's so competitive. You know, so I help coach new folks that want to break in, not into just into games, but games, animation, you name it. I've had a, a few, I've had a tattoo artist do my mentorship before, you know, so I help them get in and also tutoring and, and, and critiquing their work and things like that. Um, awesome. What else do I do? I'm pretty sure I do more. Oh, yes. <laughs> I forgot to mention my job. <laughs> So I am a professor at the Ringling College of Art and Design in two majors in VR and no, oh, I'm a professor at the Ringling College of Art and Design in two majors, virtual reality developments and game arts. So I teach a little bit about level design, game design, uh, optimization, tech arts, programming, 3D arts, you name it. So I teach a little bit of all of that and sometimes more. For example, I even teach pro, um, I even teach uh, agile development for like software huh. development, you know, like yeah. management. <laughs> um, so I teach a little bit of everything and I really like teaching. And I'm so excited to be able to kind of turn this podcast into a, just another resource for me to be able to help folks in the industry and myself. I'm going to be learning so much. Help us, you know, learn new things from these amazing professionals. Yeah. Anna, you do so much stuff. Oh my gosh. Like, uh, I feel... I feel like inadequate. <laughs> you are cooler than me in every way. So don't worry about that. <laughs> Dude, I, I don't do anything. I just like, yeah, like, uh, there was a time when I, when I did all that stuff, when I used to do a ton of stuff, but, uh, so hi, my name's Joshua Singh and, uh, but you can call me Josh. And, uh, right now I work at Marvel, um, Marvel games, and I'm an art director at Marvel games. Uh, 
basically, you know, we can talk about what that means because it, it means a lot. It's one of the most cool jobs I've ever had. Uh, but got my start in game development as well as a character artist. Um, you know, I've, I've you know, worked at Blizzard, worked at Riot, worked at a bunch of studios that no longer exist. Uh, and I currently, you know, work on all Marvel games that are in that are either coming out uh, or have come out uh, and just hang out in the country with my four kids and my wife. And we had a goat this summer. We don't have a goat anymore. Sorry, we had a sheep. What happens to the goats? Uh, uh, well, we auctioned it and they sold it. Uh, it was not a meat sheep, though. It was a, a, a petting zoo sheep. That was the only way we would do it. So because we knew we would get emotionally attached. <laughs> so it's OK. She was a sweetheart. Her name was Annabelle, like the spooky doll. I didn't make the, <laughs> the sheep, whatever. So but uh, but I've been in the industry for about, you know, 18 years and uh, and and. And I've, I've seen a lot of things happen, and I've also noticed some stuff within myself as I've grown in the industry that I, I'd love to talk about. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here is to you know share those experiences and relate with others who have had that those experiences, or maybe experiences that I haven't had yet that I can sort of wrap my head around because you know this has gone from you know back in 2004 this like almost like dark art of how do you do 3D to tutorials everywhere. It's just exploding, uh, you know. People, are, there's so there's so many game studios now, and there's so many people that want to be artists uh, or or just be close to it. Uh, and there's so many people that that think they want to be close to it until they discover like what's really going on, but they still <laughs> want to be creative, so they go do something else. And I'm interested in that as well. Oh, I'm kind of so, like that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Th you do a lot. Of, I do a lot of stuff as well that's not creative uh, as well. You know because my my hands hurt i've developed the, the, the carpal tunnel you know not that bad but uh, but you know there i feel like there's a like people like us who who are in it, you know creative and being creative their whole life but we have we have that energy and you have to get it out somehow and so you know there there's more to life than than art on your computer there's art outside the world too um and i really want to know what others do and i think it's part of being a well-balanced human uh, to have those other outside interests Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. So we have plenty of guests lined up from, again, like Josh said, all the industries already. So films, animation, we got games, we got VR, we have even cosplay, we have VFX and motion design, comics. And um, I think I even have one person that does tattoos that likes to use 3D as reference. Oh, sick. Yeah. So it's cool. all sorts of industries. Yeah. And, like and yeah, even even people that used to be in games and now do something else like that's interesting to me as well. It's like, why did you leave games? You know, um, and, you know, maybe we'll even get some non artist types like I'd love to get like a producer on, you know, or, you know, like and, and learn about help people understand the business of making games or the business of creativity, um, because that factors into a lot of our stress. Like if we don't understand, like. The, the time and manpower equation in our nine to five, we can get frustrated. So I'd love to get a producer on here to help help sort of talk about that because that's something that once I understood, they have once I learned to have empathy for my producers, like I found that, uh, you know, I understood the, the big picture a lot better. So. Yeah. And we will have all that and more. Everything. We're, we're gonna the ask things. them all your questions. By the way, if you have any specific questions for, for us to ask at any point, let us know mm. in many social medias. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we'll find out, yeah. So your social media is like way bigger than mine. Like mine's like, I think it's just a few salty game devs. It's like the same like four dudes that I know that always comment on my like, Twitter <laughs> threads or whatever. And we've been close friends, you know? And every once in a while, I think my, uh, my most popular tweet was like right when when uh, when Twitter got bought by Elon Musk. It was like November, like last year, and everything was going crazy. Like Twitter's gonna like freak out and Twitter's gonna die. And then there was that like crazy like uh, drama happening about like what is good topology, and you know someone was doing a tutorial about like well this is bad topology, and then other person's like oh this is good topology, and like there was like this whole thing. I am inviting and one of those people on the podcast. <laughs> It's already decided. <laughs> I know. And then I think it, I have to look. It got like in the thousands. Like I, I never, 
I never had a good tweet. Like my, my, my highest tweet before that was maybe like 300, you know? But then I wrote, I wrote something stupid. I, just, I, I didn't want to take sides, right? Because it's like, dude, I never, never take sides. I always play both sides, especially on Twitter. But it's like, I wrote something like, uh, hey guys, like, just be nice to each other. And remember, it's never too late to apologize. Like, to apologize. <laughs> I <laughs> saw that like, tweet. Oh, I know. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I got like 3,000 likes you know as twitter burns to the ground i'm like yes finally we did it bam like we 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 did it so you know you never know i never know so uh it, it, sometimes it does feel like we're just shouting into the void um but you know that's another thing to talk about it's like social media presence you know uh i know a lot of artists that have a very strong social media presence but at the same time uh you know and they're very successful um, and I know artists who are struggling that have a very strong social media presence at the same time. Oh, yeah. And, and I know artists that don't have a social media presence at all and they're thriving. You know what I mean? Like these little, these secret, secret, you know, artists that you never hear of. So like, that's another phenomenon as well. Um, you know, and, and, and I've, and I've talked, you know, it used to be, you know, maybe 10 years ago, you know, people be like, how do you get in the industry? And I had the answer. Like I knew, but I don't know anymore. Like, what is the equate like the, the world has changed, you know, how to get into the industry. And uh, and I think there's I think it's much different. So, I, you know, we could talk about that. Oh, yeah. All day, too. One of the guests that has already agreed to come here in March, Daniel Hashimoto, he has over a million followers. Probably if we added it up way more than a million followers and maybe he'll teach us a little bit of his tricks and how tell us how it impacted his career to have yeah. that much, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, really excited to learn how people have learned to like leverage social media. Um, you know, cause now it's like, it used to be, I could just post a picture on Instagram and people would be like, yay, that's so cool. And now it's like, you got to do like a, a reel and you have yeah. to do a movie and you have to do a dance and mm -hmm. you have to, it's like, what's trending. Oh, you know, yeah. this Marvel movie is trending. Here's my Marvel fan art I did 10 years yeah. ago. And like, so everyone's kind of always writing that in it. I find it exhausting, but uh, so I don't do it, but you know, if I was starting out, maybe I, I would, you know, maybe if I was starting and I, and I needed that exposure, you're trying to get every edge you possibly can. Oh, absolutely. So. I mean, I'm riding those waves right now. Yeah. Um, you know, I have help now because if I was by myself, I couldn't do it. Um, I, I remember those days where I used to post a picture, a screenshot from ZBrush three times a week. And I was growing, you know, reliably on Instagram and getting a following. But now you got to like jump through all these hoops. I got to post one reel every day and it takes like hours to make that many reels, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I would not do it if I wasn't getting anything out of it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. In order to celebrate our first episode, we thought that you guys might want to get to know us a little bit better and we have Josh as our co-host and he has had an enormous, tremendous career, 18 years in games. Did you guys know that as of 2018, I have not looked up the new stats on this. The average time somebody spends in the games industry is five years and it's less for women. So uh, Josh has stayed four times past that. <laughs> And he has worked at a, a lot of AAA companies that you may have heard of, like you mentioned earlier. So I feel like if anybody can give us a little insight on what that's like, it's Josh. So uh, first question, what made you want to get into games and 3D? You know, um, so my dad, so my dad was a doctor. Uh, and so I grew up kind of having access to technology, right? So I had, you know, a Sega Master System, uh, you know, with like Altered Beast and Shinobi. And this is like back in like 19, that's a Genesis, right? So like I had the Master System, like this was like in 1986, maybe? Oh, I don't even know. So I've been playing video games since I was little, like just really little. Um, and I loved them. I loved them. And, you know, and I think like so many, so many people, that was an escape for me as a little kid, you know, uh, you know, especially when you're little and, and maybe you get bullied or maybe you need an escape. Uh, like that was definitely an escape for me. Not only that, but I was always really good at, at art. You know, um, I was the kid in class who knew how to draw, uh, I was just drawing Ninja Turtles on and like Wolverine on my notebook and stuff like that. 
And that combined, so those two things combined, uh, as I got older, uh, it kind of made sense, right? So around 2004, uh, I, I broke into the industry, but I'll say maybe around 2003, it dawned on me that like actual humans make this stuff. I don't know why it never dawned on me playing it Same. as a kid. Yeah, I was just like, oh, this is computer. You need to be a computer programmer to make this, right? Like this is, and which is probably true for those older games. It was mostly done by you know programmers, but um, I know I tell the story a lot. But I think it was I was playing on the PlayStation One Metal Gear Solid, um, and I was like, dude, this is like artistic. Like an artist did this. Like this is not, you know, uh, uh, programmer art. And so I was just like, I wonder if I could do this. And I, I must have been around 20, 23, you know, maybe twenty four. Um, and I just looked it up. I looked it up. And back in those days, it was all forums, right? So I came across conceptart.org and I came across Polycount and I came across CG Chat and CG, uh, uh, you know, CG Society and all, all these things. And that's what you did is you would scan your art on a scanner uh, and then you would upload it and then people would comment on it. And I just got into that. Like, and that's really how it worked back then. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I got Maya PLE. It was called the Maya Personal Learning Edition. You get it for free. Uh, they made it really easy and wow. i just went What's through the entire like? tutorials yeah i know right like, <laughs> yeah uh you know and then i and then i got a three studio max student student edition you know uh you know and, and so i just i just went through everything and i think when you're first starting out i did you do all the tutorials right you don't know what you want to do you just like all right uh i'm gonna do the, here's the tutorial of how to make an egg and it has how to do like NURBS splines, right? And here's the tutorial of how to animate. And here's the tutorial of how to make like destructible environments. And here's the tutorial on, so you just go through everything. And I went through everything. So my first like demo reels and my first like, first like pieces of work were like just shotgun, like a little bit of rigging, a little bit of everything. Like just cause it's just taking a tour through the program. Um, and I was like, I really love this. This is what I want to do. And it, it uh, you know, it's, it wasn't just automatic. So I just, I kept working on stuff. Uh, and I, I sold used cars. I worked at like direct TV tech support. I worked at, uh, discover card. I, you know, I did all those kind of jobs because at this time I was actually married and had like one baby with another one on the way. Uh, and you know, and, 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 and by the way, I didn't have a college degree. Uh, I wasn't really good at school. Uh, but you know, I'd been through the military and, uh, you know, so I, I knew how to be disciplined. I knew how to wake up early and just do stuff uh, and then go to work and then come home and then just keep working on that stuff. Uh, and my wife was incredibly supportive. And then one day, uh, you know, I took a sick day. Uh, I think I was working at Discover Card at the time. I took a sick day and I burned my really crappy demo reel onto a DVD. Uh, back when computers had like DVD burners, mm -hmm. you know, I burned like I burned a bunch of DVDs and then I just went through the phone book like Salt Lake area game developers. And I went to I think back in those days, it was like Beyond Games, which is now gone. There's one called Incognito. They made Twisted Metal. Uh, there was one called Zygote, which they did a They did a game uh, called like Advent Rising. There were Sapphire. There, there was all these games that studios don't exist anymore. Uh, but I went door to door with a demo reel with like, and I was like, hi, you know, my name's Joshua Singh. Like, here's my, you know, shitty thing. And, <laughs> and they're just kind of like, and they're like, okay, whatever weirdo. And then I, I and then there is like a, uh, one called, uh, uh, Wahoo studios, like in Provo, Utah. And it was just like in a basement, like it was just like three guys in a basement making games. And, and they really liked me. And I think I even had a suit and tie on. I think I wore a tie. Like, <laughs> I think this is like, I didn't know, man. And so I, I came in there and they were really kind to me and they were just like, hey, you know, we're not looking for anybody, so whatever. But, I, you know, I was planting seeds, right? I was getting out there. I was, you know, we were talking about doing something embarrassing for the first time, right? Like, it's like, you know, it was, it was kind of embarrassing. I'm knocking on a cold, cold calling people, uh, you know, and I don't want to recommend people do that these days. Uh, <laughs> but back in those days, like the world wasn't as connected. Um, and so... You know, and, and, and then, you know, I think maybe three months later, you know, uh, that little studio in Provo, they, they called me up and they said, hey, we have a, a contract position. Uh, it's like 2000 bucks a month. There's no health insurance. Uh, uh, do you want the, want the job? I was like, yes. And so I quit <laughs> my job like that day. And then I started on Monday and I still didn't even really know how to UV map. Like I still didn't really know like everything, you know, I kind of knew how to UV map, but like, I literally was just like, Oh man, I had to like say a prayer. I was just like, please, like, 
God, like, what, if, help me learn how to UV map. And I just like <laughs> bashed my head. I bashed my head against it. And I learned like within that first week, I was like, I think I got this. I find, I think it just clicked. It was like a miracle. I was like, oh, I did it. So, um, yeah, man, it, it's been a journey. And it, they were very, very kind to me. And I was such a newbie. I was just, I, there was, there's so many cringy things I, I did, so many mistakes. But, you know, really all it takes is to get that one job, I think, and do well and make a good impression. Um, you know, and then, you know, so if there is ever a layoff or something, cause that's what happened. I got laid off, uh, cause it was a third party studio. We just made games for Xbox live and, and stuff like that. And I think they had one PlayStation one contract and stuff. So, uh, you know, co the contracts, you know, dry up, but they still liked me and they gave me a, like a shining recommendation and I was able, like, and, and back then this, you know, the Salt Lake game scene was very small. So, uh, they, they hyped me up and I was able to get another another job like almost immediately uh, after they had to let me go like they let me go on a Friday and then I had another job lined up for that Monday so oh, wow. you know and it's kind of been like that my whole career if I'm being honest it's it's sort of been like uh, word of mouth like it's just been it, it, um, you know I've I've been able to uh, at least in the beginning of my career it very much was like you know I had made a good impression they're like and when you're interviewing somebody when you're being interviewed it's like there are so, I, I remember one of my, one of my friends told me, you know, we became friends, but at the time we weren't really friends. We were just kind of like, I, I, he was one of, my, one of my art heroes, but we later became very good friends. He was like, he's like, your art wasn't the best. Like when we hired you, this was at a, a studio called Iron Boar. And it's now defunct, you know, but it was out in Boston. And it was my, one of my first big jobs. Um, and he's like, your art wasn't the best. Like there were other, we had another ca candidate who, uh, his art was better than your art, but he, was not as enthusiastic as you like he didn't he didn't seem like he was he really wanted it like you seemed like you really wanted it and you seemed like you were just stoked to be here and uh at the end of the day it's like we think we think we'd rather work with you you know and i was just like whoa that's you know i i was like but you didn't think my art was the best you know? like, <laughs> what are you trying to say bud um but no that's true like and, and so that that's a that that's an x factor like that is an x factor that i think a lot of young artists maybe don't realize or if they do you know just to hit home like sometimes sometimes your art won't be the best but you are someone that they want to work with like that like who you are is just as important as how good your art is sometimes um how you communicate how you carry yourself uh how you handle awkward situations um you know stuff like that and i mean i can't i'm sure we'll, we're gonna get some stories i'm sure of oh, awkward yeah awkward shit that happens in the game industry and uh and i think there's a reason i've lasted this long if i'm being honest like <laughs> and that's, that's probably one of the reasons is, you know being able to handle awkward awkward stuff and just keep going well you're in the right place <laughs> right <laughs> so it's crazy that you say that because I'm, I'm writing a book um it's about thriving as a th as an artist but that's not the point point is is that reputation is one of the main things that i hammer at just for like five chapters you know yeah. because your reputation goes a long way you can be the best artist in the world and if you don't have a personality that is um pleasant to some degree people don't want to like to ask you to do art you know they're, they're scared to be around you you're never gonna really get get anywhere you know yeah. uh, especially because nowadays everything is so connected there's like a whisper network of people mm -hmm. across the globe that know that you're not good to work with you know oh whisper network that that's something that i've that's like the uh i've heard i just recently heard that term right uh but yeah that is a, a real thing like i don't think people know but i mean i'm sure people know but i'm just gonna really reiterate it like when you apply for a job i don't know if edit this out if it's not <laughs> but like but like when someone applies for a job and they make it to the final pool i mean you can bet your ass you're gonna like they're gonna look at your socials they're gonna look at what you say on twitter they're gonna look at what you post on instagram they're gonna look at you know they're gonna look at all that because they want to get an idea of who you are um and if you are unpleasant in social media or and i doesn't say your opinion you can have an opinion uh, you know, you can, you can be outspoken on, on things that you believe in. I'm not saying, you know, don't do that, but I'm saying, um, and I'm not saying don't shit post. I mean, you know, it's fun, you know, I think, and I think if they get it, they get it, but you know, be careful, you know, like there's, there, there, there are things they're going to look at to see what your voice is. And one thing that I think from day one, 
I think of Facebook. Like when I, when I first got on Facebook back in 2006, you know, I was like, this could be really dangerous. Like I'm never going to say anything that I would never say that I would say in real life. Right. Like I would never say or, 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 or interact in a way that I wouldn't interact in real life. So, you know, I could honestly say that like my, my online voice is, is like how I really am. So I think that that helped as well, but you're absolutely right, Anna. Like, uh, reputation is a big, big deal. And it, and when, if your reputation takes a day, it, it's, a, you know, it, I, it, it's, it's rough. It's rough. It, it takes a long time to get back. Uh, if you have a strong network, you know, uh, that, that helps, but, but man, social media is a, is a minefield, you know, mm -hmm. um, just be authentic, just be, be, be your real self. Cause I think that's the assumption is that you're being your real self. Yeah. So if, if you if you do anything cruel or if you do anything mean, or if you are a bully or anything like that on social media, it's safe to assume that you, you're kind of like that in real life and oh, yeah. that can follow you into job applications and, and interviews and all that stuff. So, so I'm a highly online person. I would say, you know, um, I've never described myself as an influencer because I don't relate to that, but I am, you know, mm -hmm. and artists will come on my page and leave nasty comments mm -hmm. and things like that. And they'll have their real name on there. They'll say like looking for, for opportunities, you know, things like that, their real work. And I'm like, really dude, like, really you're gonna really? do this like, this industry yeah, like, is so small <laughs> yeah you know yeah. yeah and then and then it's it's happened it's happened where someone has has been shitty and then all of a sudden their name is in the hiring pool and it's like nope instant pass like instant pass and another thing like i see a lot I, I, i've seen it curb a little bit as as my network has gotten older it's 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 stopped a little bit but i still see it from time to time um you know, people shitting on movies that their colleagues have worked on. <laughs> and I'm like, bro, stop, stop. Like literally like your friends worked on that. Like you have people in your net, like it's like, oh, this gods of Egypt movie sucked or Ninja Turtle design, they hate it. Or this Robocop or hey, like whatever, this new Marvel movie, I hate it. Ugh. And it's like, dude, like you need to chill out, bro. Like this is like, you're in the same room with those artists, you know? Uh, and I was just like, dude, like, just don't do that. Even if the script is bad, even if the movie is bad, professional courtesy is a, is a real thing. Like the, your friends and your colleagues put mad long hours into that. And, you know, and, and the same goes for games, you know, it's like, oh, I hate this game or this game's so cringe or blah, blah, blah. It's like, dude, you had, there are people that you're like maybe one step removed from that have been working on this for five years. Like what's the whole hall of hullabaloo <laughs> say old, people, <laughs> old people words <laughs> i'm not that old uh you know the, there was like this all the scuttlebutt and hubbub about that uh for spoken game right they're like oh, oh yeah it was so cringy blah it's like it's like bro just chill out like you know your your friends and your colleagues put mad hours into that and that looks like a it, to me it looked like a labor of love and then i saw a lot of people saying like dude it's actually legit yeah i haven't played it yet but but you know just even if you are critical of something, it's like, just be courteous. Like there, just be kind, you know, like if you're kind on social media, it's, 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 you can't lose. Like why, like why, why even, why even be tempted to be cruel, yeah. you, you know, on social media. So I would do constructive feedback only. Yeah. Constructive feedback. If, if that's where, it, you know, and we could, that's another whole topic. It's like how to give feedback, how to give constructive feedback. Uh, and we could talk about all we, we could, first we would start out with all the shitty feedback that we've ever gotten <laughs> and how because how, that's funny. I have a 20 and, minute story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, and all the ways you've been told that you suck and all the ways that you've been told that your art sucks and therefore and and all the ways that artists interpret that to mean that they suck uh, because there's a little bit of pe there's a little bit of us in, in all of our art. You know, when someone comes by and says, I don't like it or she looks ugly or that, 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 that hero character doesn't look handsome. You're kind of like, yeah. hmm, you know, but you know, how to, how to develop this. They, they say it's a thick skin, but I don't know if it's, maybe it's better. Just like, I don't know. I think there's a better term than thick skin. I think it's just being secure. Like, I, like be, you know, I don't, I always just describe it as like being able to separate your ego from your work. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't have a good I, name for I, that. 
Yeah, because I, I feel like once I was able to do that, separate myself from my work, um, I also was just kind of a more secure person in general. Like, so like my art wasn't my identity. Like I knew, you know, that my art wasn't uh, all there was to me. And this, this was just a job, uh, you know, and uh, oh, what we were talking about the other day, like, you know, you know, when I said this is just a job, it's like, oh, passion, right? Like, yeah. blah, you know, that, that, you're like freaked out. You're like, no, passion, not that <laughs> word. And I'm the same way. And like when that word is used inappropriately and for the wrong reasons, it makes me mad. Um, but, you know, yeah. So, um, so, so, yeah, just the whole social media thing and then being secure in yourself and uh, learning how to take feedback and give feedback constructively uh, if it's needed. But it's like, dude, how am I going to give construct? If, I mean, you're, you're different, right? Like people might be like, you know, Anna, look at my scope, like followed your tutorial. What do you think? And then it's like, you're, that's like solicited. They're like, they're like summoning you, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I think that it's like, sometimes a lot of people give that unsolicited feedback and it's just like, whatever, you know? Um, but I don't know. So maybe some people are like, oh no, man, like, I appreciate it. Like, thanks, random person, for telling me that, you know, the the pores are too big or whatever. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll really work on that. But I I just feel like that's exhausting. No, it's and I not feel nice. like, and I feel it feels kind of like a like energy vampire kind of thing, right? It feels like someone's getting getting their shits and giggles, like critiquing. It has to be, yeah. it has to be two ways, right? You, anonymous anonymous feedback when I don't even know who you are or I I don't know your artwork and I don't even know like like if you have the authority to even be critiquing my stuff in such a way, uh, it's like, mm, it's a door I'd rather not open. You know? I got lucky. Sen sentiment. Yeah. I got lucky that I got this perspective really early because one of the like crappiest fellow peers I had in college when I was getting a game art degree, uh, he was the master of unsolicited advice. He would have the two cents to give for everything, everything, even like professional work, professional games, movies, your work. If he was in the room, nothing was safe. He even one day told me that I would look really good as a blonde. And I'm like, I didn't ask, but thanks. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And he was the worst kid in class. Awesome. awesome. So... <laughs> I, I got that but, perspective really early. I'm like, you know, you only want to listen to advice from people who you do trade places with, right? Yeah. Or folks that have more experience than you. They have more, um, what do you call it when you have more, like, better reputation than yours, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. in your field. You don't want to take advice yeah. from some randos. No offense to all the randos that give advice and the internet maybe stop doing that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think there's there's one thing to be said. So I'm gonna like flip. I'm gonna flip the script now, right? Because I'm sure someone's gonna be like, "Well, it's my right. I can critique." All right. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, all right. All right. All right. All right. Because like that was the whole point back in the day of putting your art up on the forums is like you wanted that unsolicited critique because but you went to reputable forums, right? You went to places where like professionals would lurk. <laughs> but I feel as though you know. If I'm a student with other students and they're critiquing my work um, and they're my equal, you know, I, I, I do still think that that's valid. Yes. Um, you know, and, and there's and there's also the whole phenomenon of, you know, you're at a studio and, uh, you know, the CEO or or a high level producer is like, look at your looks at your work and it's like, oh, it should be blue. You know, they don't know art. You know, I, I, I think the difference is being prescriptive feels offensive uh, from people who don't understand the process, but sentiment is still valuable. It's like, it, and, and one of my things that I, that I learned and that I try to teach young artists and any artist will listen is everybody has an opinion and they can tell what they like and what they don't like, but they just don't know how to express it sometimes. So they'll be like, eh, that looks like Shrek. Or they'll say like, eh, that looks like my ex-girlfriend who I hate. And they'll say like, eh, I don't like pink. It's like, like that kind of feedback, you kind of have to like, it's just like sentiment feedback. It goes into another bucket, you know? It's like, okay, they don't like it for weird subjective reasons. I can't do anything about that. I call that um, art direction feedback. Is that Where the... it's like, that's what I call it in class anyway. I'm like, you know, it's not objective. It's subjective, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. Kind of how yeah. like an art director would be like, that should be pink, not blue. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I... yeah. And I think it's fair to like label it that, you know, and I try to do that as well. It's like, hey, this is just a subjective feedback. But does anyone think that her eyes are too far apart, you know, or does anybody think that like, 
you know, I don't know, whatever. But like, you know, if, if no one else, like, I, I noticed that a lot with the Marvel projects, you know, uh, sometimes we'll see stuff that, you know, it's a character that we all know. It's a character, you know, like Spider-Man or something. And it's kind of like, there's something off about it. I don't know what, I can't really say. And, and actually it's the job of an artist to help. Uh, I, I think it's the job of the artist who has the vocabulary to, to sort of like have that patience and have, uh, and especially if you're a high level artist, like an art director or a lead, to have the patience to sort of walk the path with someone who's, Whose 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 intentions are earnest and whose intentions are good. You know, they're not just trying to like you. You could you know, they're not a bad actor. They're not trying to be a blowhard. They they really are trying to articulate, but they just can't. Um, and I've done that a lot, uh, especially as I've moved into higher level roles. Is is help people understand what they don't like because they really can't. They really can't articulate it. They're just like, I don't know why I don't like it. And and, and I'll be like, is it you know? It, it really is just kind of like, is it the nose? Is it the eyes? Is it the thing? And and, and I think just open up that dialogue and and help them feel comfortable enough to be vulnerable to admit they don't know why, uh, and then and then walk that path and try to diagnose like what they don't like. And a lot of times, it does make it better. You know, a lot of times it does. It there is something like we as artists do have blind spots, and so I, I would say that that's like higher level, like like high level artists. Like if you if you don't have the patience yet, or if you haven't disconnected yourself from the work, and if you take it personally, you could definitely be like, uh, whatever. You can't even articulate what you don't like. How dare you? Uh, but if if it's someone who's on your team and it's someone who has, uh, you know, intentions to make the the thing better, you can at least help them articulate it. And once you articulate it, then you can be like, yeah, I'm not going to change it. <laughs> <You know>? or, <laughs> but at least they feel heard, right? Yeah. Uh, and I feel like that is a that is a, a big a big deal so uh next question what's it like working in triple a games oh man uh so i've been fortunate enough to work you know in triple a and indie uh and like mid i guess there's a thing called like double a you know i guess triple a means like you know what triple a means it, it means like uh uh like the best in programming the best in art and the best in like narrative or something like that it's supposed to be like the best across the three uh sort of tenants of a good game so so triple a you know but i i've heard people talk to like mid-level studios like double a you know like we're smaller so we can't do triple a we can't do like you know hire actors and you know make these giant things but we can make a really fun awesome experience that isn't like you know a hollywood production Anyway, just a fun fact. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> but I've been fortunate enough to work at all that stuff, and triple A. So I would say I worked in that like double A. <laughs> it sounds like batteries. I'm not. Even, <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. But like you know, mid level studios, right? So um, that's you know, I got my start in those really small basement kind of studios, <clears throat> and then moved up to a little studio in Boston called Iron Lore, which was kind of like that mid level. They were a t they were a third party publisher, uh, I think. You know. Um, a lot of a lot of them were ex ensemble. They made uh, Rise of Empires and stuff like that from Texas, um, and uh, and and they made a game called Titan Quest. There's a poster. I still <laughs> nice. have it after all these years. The whole team. It's a game that like no one knows about, but it means a lot to me because it was a really big experience for me to 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 make a game that was actually be published uh, through a big publisher like that. And and I made a tons of friends on that that I saw, I I'm friends with to this day. Um, Cause it was a small studio, you know, I'd say maybe it was like maybe 50, 70 people, you know? Uh, and you could know it. You knew everybody, you, you could know everyone. And we all, we, we crunched, you know, we could talk, oh, we're going to talk about crunch culture and all that stuff. But, but I, I had fun. I had fun there. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it, um, it was very different, uh, you know, and then after that went to Vigil Games, which is kind of the same vibe. Vigil was like Joe Mad, Joe Maduera. He was a comic book artist. Uh, and then he's a game developer. We worked on like Darksiders and Warhammer, and that was in Texas, another THQ studio. Um, again, sort of that middle. I think this was like maybe like 100 people, maybe 120 people. I didn't know everybody at Vigil, but I felt like I could have. I was just kind of an introvert, so I didn't. I knew everybody on my team, but I didn't know like all the programmers. I didn't know because they had it was a, it was a bit large enough studio to have two games going, whereas Iron Lord was only like one game going, and maybe like two guys on R and D for like a, another thing. Like like Vigil was large enough for two studios, and that's when I first kind of got my first taste of like not knowing everybody and people having like clicks and people having you know 
uh, people that they talked to or people that they didn't like. And, and I was like, Ooh, like people being catty towards one another. Um, but I didn't really experience too much of it. I just kind of observed it and just like heard other people talking about stuff like that. Uh, by the way, I'm playing with it like a tripod thing. If you know. <laughs> it's like my, fidget. You're good. <laughs> this is my fidget thing that I'm fidgeting with. Um, and so, uh, then I got, went to Blizzard in Irvine and Blizzard in Irvine was like, whoa, triple A. This is a museum. They have a cafeteria. They have a gym. They have, you know, if I ride my bike to work, they'll give me money. Um, there's just, they'll give me a whole wardrobe of like Blizzard stuff. And I get a free, you know, just like the whole like rock star thing. Right. And that's when I was just like, whoa, like. I feel like a stranger here. I, I, I wasn't ready. I, I really wasn't ready. And I, and, and, um, it was, it was kind of lonely if I'm being honest, it, it was, it was kind of lonely because there was so much pressure and it, there was a few people on that team for, uh, who I'm friends with. We were friends before I worked there. We were like friends from, we were like internet friends, uh, like in, like on poly count and, you know, sharing memes and stuff like that. And so when we, when I, when we met in real life, we, we became even better friends. So we were already tight. So I was grateful to already have that friend group who were only, who were like the character artists. We were just the character artist crew, but there was a character artist crew. And then there's like a game, de- there's like an engineering crew. And then there's like a game designer crew. And then, there's a, and then we never intermingled. Like it was just like, you go to lunch with your click and that's it. And I, I, I didn't really like it. And then uh, you know, so I didn't really thrive. I'll be honest. I, I, maybe I could have, you know, maybe I could knowing what I know now, maybe I could have, but being the sort of like, I was kind of arrogant, uh, and also kind of introverted. Um, and I didn't take feedback well, if I'm being frank. Uh, and I didn't understand the business. I didn't understand the business as well as I do now. And so, uh, I, and I also was a very opinionated and my opinions were frankly wrong. <laughs> uh, and my friend, and so I wasn't, so I was shouting out these wrong opinions or these like very, so my opinions were actually right, but it was hard for people to hear because I didn't know that I was actually hurting people's feelings or I was like maybe lowering morale by being so, such a blowhard about things that were wrong because they were wrong and everybody knew they were wrong and they, but Josh, you don't need to put a target on your face, you know? So that's kind of what I did. And so, um, but I was just like, man, I, I just feels, it just feels kind of lonely. Uh, and the swag and the free stuff and the free world of Warcraft and all that stuff, it didn't make up for the lack of like real friends, like real crunk camaraderie that I had had at those other studios, you know? Um, and, uh, again, like I said, I did had friends, but you know, they didn't, they, I felt like they kind of, I, I was at a different stage in my life than they were. Like I had kids, I had, uh, you know, all these things and they were all very young and they were still like partying and all. So I had friends at work. We were very, very tight at lunch together. Uh, but you know, outside of work, there really wasn't a lot we had in common because I was just so much like in a different phase. We actually were technically the same age. I just like had kids younger. So, uh, then at riot riot was back to being a small studio. Like I, when I joined riot, it was maybe 200 people. So it felt a lot more like, like vigil did back in the day. Right. Uh, where not everybody knew everybody, but I actually was growing in confidence. And so I made it a point throughout my years at riot to get to know as many people as possible and work with as many teams as possible. And I felt like I, I, that was a good thing because I, I learned, I learned a lot about the games, the, uh, the game industry, like the business of it, like, and I made friends with my producers and they let kind of let me have a peek behind the curtain to see, you know, how the numbers work and, and, you know, what KPI meant and KPIs and, you know, a little bit of that scrum, you know, agile stuff, you know, and how to keep things organized. And it may help me see the, 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 the giant equation of, of time and money and, and, and manpower and like the demands. And, uh, and I did my best to help if I'm being frank, like I'm, I did my best to help the producers in a creative way to add value to the product uh, wherever I could. Cause they didn't really know like a lot of these young producers, they were like MBA graduates, uh, and they understood business, but they, and they played games, but they didn't quite understand how to make games yet. They didn't understand how to do 3d. They didn't understand how to, how long it took to paint a texture map. And, and so I showed them that stuff so that they could make better estimations. And they showed me the other stuff, like, and we, we became friends. And so when I wanted to do something creative, they knew 
like for instance, like uh, you know, like go back and redo some of the old characters, or go back and redo the texture maps uh, for for and not change the model, just change change the texture map because it's a paint, hand painted, you know, diffuse only kind of game. They knew what I was talking about, and they knew that I, I could do it, and so I was able to add value in a way that they understood, um, and and we were able to do things that you know back in those days that wouldn't normally be done. Uh, and we were still small enough to take those big risks, you know, and like I was submitting stuff straight to the main game. So I would just be painting stuff and they gave me access to like just insert it into the mainline Perforce branch so it would get shipped. <laughs> like because they knew they, they I guess what I'm saying is we built trust like that. It's it's much more difficult to build that kind of trust on a triple A game than it is in a small studio, I would say. It's not impossible, but it takes a lot more time uh honesty uh i think candor um and and sort of like uh, empathy and kindness in your communication style to build that kind of trust and you do it first with your with your team your immediate team and then auxiliary teams and then like tertiary teams etc until you're known as somebody who's capable uh and you have built that trust um so it's a different mindset like i said it'd be very lonely until you learn how to have specific communication styles so uh, yeah, and then AAA, you know, of course you get the you get the the, the high of of having people see your stuff, um, and also the soul crushing, uh, you know, sort of feelings of having people see your stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> so you know, you know, we would we would we would we would ship things, um, and people are like, I hate it, or we'd ship things, and we'd be like, I love it. Um, and after a while, you kind of like, eh. As long as I like it, I liked it, you know, and you begin to realize that, especially if it's on a rapid cadence, like I really couldn't handle the five year dev cycle. I, I really liked working at Riot on League of Legends because it was a very quick to make a new character. It was like three months, you know, and like all the skins and it was just very rapid iteration because we required it required volume. They required a huge library of skins and characters in order to meet, you know, the sort of like product goals. And so we were able to be very free in our ideas. Um, and, and it was like, Hey, like I, I, I remember when I went to riot, like I finally shipped my first skin. It was like, I can't even remember. It was like, it was, it was some skin. I can't remember, but, but it was like, Hey guys, remember I, I do make games, mom. I, I look, I mean, here's a video game mm -hmm. thing that I made. Cause I hadn't, you know, from, from, from 38 studios to actually from vigil games to 38 studios to, which I was there for that. We could educate the young the young developers on that whole fun thing. It was really fun. Not, not fun. It was really bad. It was bad decision-making, bad business. Uh, but, you know, and then uh, Blizzard, I had not had shipped, I had not shipped any content for like five years. So I was really getting, like we had talked before, reputation. I wasn't getting by on a portfolio of shipped work. I was getting by on a portfolio of personal work and good connections and a good reputation. Ringley Pre-College is seeking visionary VR students with the story and drive to succeed. Do you see yourself creating a three-dimensional, computer-generated virtual reality environment where users can be immersed within your imagined or simulated worlds? Is it games, training, or emotional sport? What inspires you to do this work? If this describes you, we want to hear your story. What excites you about these possibilities? Submit your 500-word story in writing or video by March 3rd to mmurphy at c.ringling.edu. Three selected entries will be awarded $1,000 each towards pre-college 2023 tuition. One selected entry will be awarded a full scholarship to pre-college 2023. In accepting the award, you fully agree to enroll in the virtual reality immersion. Visit www.fringling.edu slash pre-college and click on connect with us to book an online info session. And make sure to submit your written or video story as described above. Back to our programming. So Josh, what was the biggest challenge you've had to overcome in your career so far? So I think... That every, I think every video game artist or every creative, let's say every creative has a moment where they go, do I want to do this anymore? Uh, is it worth it? You know, and then you get in those conversations like, what would you do if you weren't making games? What were you doing? What would you, and you, and you begin to think, so, um, you know, I want to say, you know, full, full, full disclosure. Like I, you know, I was let go from Blizzard. 
Uh, I saw it coming. I saw it coming a mile away, you know, but I wasn't a good fit and I wasn't happy. So, uh, but in my mind, Blizzard was like the top of the mountain, you know, and, it, and it, it's like, where do you go from there? It's like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, being an animator and working at Disney or, you know, being in aeroscience and working at NASA or whatever. It's like a well-known thing where you're going to, and the fact that I, I, like they rejected me, I was like, oh, and I was like, I don't know, man, I don't know if I could take this kind of rejection anymore. It was like, it was like being shunned by like, you know, your crush or something. Um, but, it, but, you know, but then being honest with myself, like I wasn't happy there. Like I was giving up too much of who I was to try and fit in. And it, it just, I'm not built that way. Like I couldn't, I couldn't do it. So, uh, you know, and it wasn't like, and then to be fair, it wasn't like that across Blizzard, across the board. It's just, you know, it was just my particular experience. Um, so that was one time where I was just like, I don't know what to do. Where do I go from here? Uh, you know, and so I did contract for a little bit to keep the, the lights on. And then, uh, uh, you know, Riot fell into my lap because of I have some good friends that that worked at Blizzard with me and liked me and then went to Riot and said, hey, you should come to Riot. Like that's, you know, kind of the thing. Um, so that's the first time I thought <clears throat> about getting out of the game industry. The second time I thought about getting out of the game industry was in 2018. Uh, I This is the first time I was an art director. It was at a little startup called Wave Dash. And we were all like, what the founders were all first time, first time general manager, first time CEO, first time art director. We were all first timers. Uh, and they did a good job, you know, raising money uh, and getting things started, but they couldn't stick the landing. Money ran out. It's a, this is this whole, there's a, I could write a book on this, but like, you know, a lot of, a lot of insecurities uh, came to the forefront and the bad decisions were made. Uh, and I had, I, I ended up being the CEO of the company because, uh, you know, the, the other two, you know, weren't there anymore. Uh, and so I had to liquidate the company. I had to lay everybody off. I had to do their W-2s. I had to settle the debt with, with the contractors. Um, and I got to see what that looks like from the other side. Like I had been laid off, but I had never shut down a company. I had never, I had never closed the doors before. And that was a sobering experience, especially if you are a normal human being with feelings and you're not a sociopath, you know, uh, like, so I, I felt very guilty and I felt very, I felt a lot of shame and I felt a lot of embarrassment, uh, you know, liquidating computers, liquidating soft, you know, uh, hardware be, to settle a debt and then negotiating like, hey, we owe you this much. Would you take 20 percent? Because that's all we got. And then, you know, and the best I could do is just leave glowing reviews, uh, glowing recommendations for everybody that, that had to leave, um, you know, so just all this stuff. Like there was a board of directors, a board of investors that I had to like appease and, you know, uh, so that was a very sobering moment because then I got to see the other side of game development, um, not just the artistic side and the fun, cool, like, hey, we're making, you know, we're making cool superheroes and, and monsters and all that. But I got to see what producers and CEOs and managers, what they're trying to protect the artists from. Like I got to experience that pain that they, that, that, that those people on that side of the office get to experience when they fail. And so that was just like mind blowing. And I, and I think about it to this day and though it was super painful, like it was a, an extremely uh, humbling and an eye opening experience. And, and like I said, because I had invested in my network and I had invested in, in making sure that I did things the right way, even in this worst case scenario, I somehow still had friends and I still had people who cared about me. Uh, and you know, uh, and, and people dude, artists, I think just creative people in general have a lot of empathy when they see someone suffering, they, their heart goes out to them, you know? Uh, and so I had friends who, who saw what I was going through and they saw that this wasn't a pain, uh, uh, this, this wasn't like a run of the mill kind of pain. I was feeling, this was a very unique high level pain. Uh, because it was it was leadership pain, and we can talk about that. This was the pain of uh, this was the kind of pain that forges leaders, you know. Because if if you're a if you're a leader and you've never seen how bad it can get, 
um, you know, like you need to, you need to, so, so that you don't do it, so that you don't go there. Uh, and, and I have to say that experience absolutely helped me be a better art director, helped me be, be, be a better lead, um, because having experienced all that, 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 that hard stuff, it helped me communicate with all the CEOs and all the executive producers that I ever worked with since, because they know. In fact, that's, that's one of the reasons, uh, I think that's, that's something that got me into Marvel, uh, because you know the, the vice president of, of games, we actually worked together at Blizzard. Um, I told him that, he's like, dude, He's like, Josh, everybody should start a company and have it fail. I was like, what? <laughs> he's, all, he's like, everybody should have that experience of starting a company and having it fail because that just means the next one you'll start won't fail, you know? And, um, as, lo and I, as long as I learn, you know, as long as I learn and I keep it in remembrance and I understand why in the correct way, and I, and I don't blame anybody, but as long, as long as I understand, then it's, it's not a failure. It's just, it's, it's actually a valuable experience that I had. So. Yeah, so we that's, were talking about AAA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty admirable, though, because there are people out there that will go through that experience and not learn anything. Yeah. I know some or, of those or, people. Yeah, you know? or be bitter. It would have been very easy. Like, I call people on the phone, Anna, on the phone, like their voice in my ear, and I'm telling them I can't pay them. And I'm not saying I can't pay them, but there's no money in the bank to pay them. There's only so much money and we owe so much money and I can only pay a percentage and would they be willing to take a bunch of Cintiqs maybe like a Cintiq, <laughs> you know, like, or maybe like uh, some hard drives, you know, and it's like, Oh my gosh. So like, that was it, you know? And, and that was kind of my only thing. And, and, and honestly, a lot of people were like, dude, we thought you were going to ghost us. Like we thought that you were just going to like leave this debt and just be gone. The fact that you're calling us up and even trying to make it right, we really appreciate it. And that's, that's something that I think that is, you know, it, it gave me hope, you know, that, that, that this industry is full of caring people. And if you have integrity and, and a little bit of courage, it goes a long way, especially when it comes to those, those worst case scenarios. So yeah, that was an experience. And, and, and it, I think it made me a better human, to be honest with you, um, to, to have to go through that. Uh, and it, 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 it definitely made me a better, uh, you know, better lead. Uh, Cause I could talk to people about that and just be like, yeah, dude, you don't ever, want to it's one thing being laid off and it's another laying people off i mean that's a current topic right now like google and and all these you know big companies like they're laying people off through email and it's just like ooh, that's they are uh, that's, being that's, a little heartless purpose. they are yeah yeah they're not laying them off because they have to that's my belief you know they're laying them off because of greed maybe they're trying to save up so that they can invest during the worst part of the recession it's not yeah. good i, I it's, don't even get me started on that whole topic <laughs> yeah yeah you know and me like i work for disney you know it's like okay this is a mega giant huge corporation you know and and it's hard i remember at riot you know i would ask the leaders at riot in like all hands i'm like how riot's growing by leaps and bounds it's like 2013 2012 when the game just taken off i'm like how how can we like still care about people while still growing at this rapid pace? How can we still care about people um, and let them know that they're cared for without resorting to like platitudes and bureaucracy and managerial sort of robotness? And they didn't have an answer. You know, they're being honest. Like they didn't have an answer. And I don't, I don't, I don't blame them. And and if someone were to ask me that, it's like, dude, how would you? You know, at, at Disney or, or or EA or any of these huge giant companies, take two. How would you make people feel uh, valued? Like if if they did have to lay someone off, you had to lay off ten thousand people. How would you do it with empathy, uh, with integrity? And I I don't know, but I know it's not through an email. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I yeah. Do you see how Elon Musk did it, like with memes in the email? You don't get me started. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, yeah, it's, it's really yeah. hard. Like, I don't know. Um, yeah. Let's move to a new, much ni nicer topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So have you had a lot of experience hiring people in the past? I do. Yeah, I have experience. Okay. So when you hire new artists, what do you look for? 
Okay. Man. Okay. So, uh, hiring a new artist. So, uh, this is how it works. This is, this is how it works now. I'm an art director and I'm just jamming. I'm doing my job. I'm like, you know, and then we have a meeting. We're like, we need some artists. We need some talent. Who do you know? I get asked, who do you know anybody who's looking? And I'm like, geez, I don't know. Well, what are you looking for? Oh, we're looking for this kind of experience level, blah, blah, blah. And so it's like, first off, I get asked who I know and to reach out to them. That's the, that's, that's honestly. And then if there's, if I don't, and so if I do know someone who's interested, I reach out to them and say, Hey man, are you looking? We're looking for someone that just like, so I'm not even a recruiter. I'm an art director and they're asking me to plumb my network of people that I know and trust to potentially apply. So this is how it really works. At least in my experience. No, it is. Every job I've ever gotten has been exactly like that opposite way. Right. Mm -hmm. So I've never, uh, this is weird. I've never applied for a job properly. I've always been invited to apply, you know, Mm -hmm. so it was always through my network and the reputation I built. Uh, Even sometimes not directly, like uh, somebody who's looking will ask somebody, they're like, I'm too busy. Go talk to Anna, you know? So it's always Mm -hmm. been like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, same, same. And then, uh, you know, let's say I ask and everybody's happy or there is nobody or I don't know anybody. Then it's like, nah, nah, I don't really know anybody looking right now. Uh, and they're like, OK, so then the next step is like just, you know, the, rec- the recruiter is the recruiting you know, team is doing their job. And then they they uh, if you have a good recruiting team, you know, I, I would who I would encourage every art director to go to lunch with their recruiting team so that they know what you're looking for, like what good art looks like. So they don't send you a bunch of just like, like, like portfolios that are unusable. You know, if, if you're looking for a character artist and then you get a bunch of like graphic design applicants, it's like, no, like this is just wasting my time. Right. I now. get That's those all the need. time on LinkedIn. They're like, Oh, I hear you make games. Here's this uh, engineering position. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like educate the recruiters on what you're really looking for so that they can, uh, they can help screen at the bare minimum, you know, like teach them terms like 3D artist, like ZBrush, Maya, 3ds Max, Unity, Unreal. You know, we're not looking for people that uh, are, you know, graphic designers that are like really good at like I don't know, Dreamweaver, like Cork Express. Are those even things people use anymore? I don't know. When I went to college, it was like Cork Express, Dreamweaver, Flash, like to make websites, it's like whatever. Flash is uh, not even supported anymore. You know that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm totally <laughs> aging myself right now. Like obsolete <laughs> programs, like like from the olden days, from the before times. Uh, but, you know, so, so it's okay. So now they, they send me a bunch, like maybe they have like workable or, you know, whatever, some program, and then they'll send you a bunch of stuff. You look through them and uh, I'll be honest, the first thing I look at is portfolio. I don't even read. I look at the, I get the resume and then I'm like, where's the link? Where's the link to portfolio? Blah, 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 power levels, all these cute, cutesy things on their portfolio. See, I don't even care. I'm like portfolio first, boom, okay. And if you make me look for the portfolio, I'm already like, I'm already pissed when I get to your <laughs> art station or whatever it is, right? So I was like, oh, I had to look for your portfolio. I wasn't just front and center, right? It should be like your name, portfolio, then contact info. And so I look at the portfolio and if it's, let's say it's not good, it's like, okay, instant, like, okay, next. Uh, if it is good or, or maybe there are good things, depending on the, on the level, right? If it's a junior associate position, it's like, okay, I, I could, I could get a, uh, a mid-level to senior to work with this person to get them up to speed. Like, I think that they're, they're doable, right? Um, I'll put them in the pool, right? And if it's just, no, it's no. Uh, and then, you know, so, so depending on the position, like it's mid junior or senior or lead, that's kind of, I'm looking at the level of artwork, you know, and I am looking at the telltale signs of like, you know, is it only ZBrush sculpts? Uh, is it, or do the, are these game ready? Can I look at wireframes? Can I look at texture sheets? Can I look at the bakes? Uh, that's really important. Um, you know, and if I, and cause a lot of times I'll get sent portfolios of just amazing sculpts. And then this person does not know how to process the mesh at all. Um, which is something that is, you know, getting easier actually, you know, these days, but it still needs to be done. Um, and so, uh, you know, so if they, let's say they have everything, uh, if, actually, if they don't, if they don't have that stuff, if it's only beautiful sculpts, it's, it's a no. Cause it's like, I don't know, like, you know, 
And and if I'm feel if I have time, I'll write feedback. It's like, hey man, you really need to like show that you can make a game ready asset. Cheers, the best. See you, see you later down the road. Uh, but if let's say they do have everything, uh, it goes goes into the the next phase, the next bucket of like, okay, I think we could do a phone interview. Do a phone interview, uh, and that's when you get to. I like to just have a conversation. Like you know, there's always the interview questions like, you know, like uh, you know, like name a time there was conflict and you like resolved it or to tell their name a time when there was something wrong and you fixed it or name a time there's you helped somebody you know all he's just trying to get to know like what kind of person they are right these are all like sort of questions I, I really just want them to tell me a story like tell me stories like tell me tell me about your life tell me who you are because if your art your, your art has art if you're getting a phone screen your art has already been deemed in my opinion like your your art has already been seen as something that would fit within the team. Now we just want to know who you are. And if, if, um, you know, and even if you're a quiet person or you're shy or something, uh, at least show that you're amicable, you know, at least laugh, at least show that you are, um, someone, you know, you may not, you may not be the making the jokes, you know, you may not the one be the one telling the stories, but you can give great feedback on the things that you do here. You can give, great uh you know uh sort of at least jump off of stories because like i'm i'm an interviewer who will if you're being quiet like i'll i'll throw you a bone because i know that there are quiet people and not everybody has the gift of gab so <laughs> you know it's like i'll throw you a bone you know i'll, I'll give you a, i'll give you a softball question to kind of get you out of your shell um and and so um and if that goes well uh you know these days they don't they don't really do on-site anymore you know uh, so honestly, these days, if the phone interview goes well or the Zoom meeting goes well, turn your camera on, make sure you look presentable, make sure your house is not a mess, whatever, uh, or just, you know, but you do want to be on camera. Or just blur the background know. like I am just right blur, now. Just blur the background. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I know. Uh, that's usually, uh, that's usually enough. It's like, yeah, they, 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 they in, in this day and age with work from home and everything, it's like, yeah, I mean, they, they seemed cool. Uh, you're my dogs. Please. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Know. Okay, sorry. We'll edit that out. Uh, anyway, but you know, and that's basically it. It's like, oh yeah, this person they, they they can talk. They're awesome. They seem work. They seem like they would fit well on the team. Uh, and if we were to meet them in real life, I think it'd be just fine. You know, uh, and that's kind of the process. So Do anything? Do you do anything different? No, you're 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 good. I I I do the same things when I'm hiring. I have much less experience than you, but I have hired before. Um, I also look for the wording in the cover letter a little bit. I recently hired an assistant, which is like, you know, not 100% an industry thing, but still it's an mm -hmm. assistant. Um, and so many people sent in cover letters that were frankly a little bit off-putting. And they were like, Anna, I want to be your assistant because you know what you're doing when it comes to 3D. You're known in the industry. I want to get in on that, basically. You know, like, I think I can learn a lot from you. I think I can, uh, you know, uh, use this as a way to break into the industry. I think I can do this and that. And I was like, why, why are you trying to get a job with me by telling me what I can do for you? You know, mm -hmm. I, what, what value do you bring? And I, I hammer this home with my mentees all the time because I'm always looking at their resumes and cover letters and things like that. Like, that. like you want to tell them what you you bring to the table, you know, uh -huh. in every way, be it your personality, your soft skills, your art skills, your listening skills, like discipline it doesn't matter you know like what you bring to the table focus on that i've seen a lot of like you know younger professionals making this huge mistake just so recently so a few months ago <laughs> it's fresh on my mind you know and yeah. it was so many josh it was like 40 people yeah that's really interesting uh i've seen that too you know i've seen that too i've seen uh a sort of selfishness right like you can just kind of feel it um, because it, it really is, it, it really is like, not what you hate this. I, it's like, Hey, this is what you can do for me. This is what you can do for me. It's like, no, 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 no. We want to know what you can do for us. Like, yeah. that's why, you know, uh, yeah, that, that's a kind of tone deafness. I think that, that, uh, especially young people, um, uh, you know, or not even say young people, like just inexperienced people, maybe, uh, kind of have, you know, and that, that's a, that's a great point. You really do want to highlight what you bring to the table, even if it was not much, right? Like, um, I, 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 I tend to not really, 
I tend to not really look at that as closely as you. Like I, I do I a do. phone interview. Like I, I, I tend to get a lot from like the phone, like the Zoom interview. Like I want to look at them. I want to, I want to see how they talk. Uh, I want to see their eyes when they talk, you know, and you know, if the vibe's wrong, then I'm like, mm, I don't know. Um, but like, but then even then also, like if they talk about themselves a lot or they, uh, or they use a lot of buzzwords or they use a lot of, you know, fancy talk, I'm kind of like, mm, you don't know what you're talking about. Like yeah. if people use a lot of fancy talk, I'm like, it's cause you don't, if you can't put it simply, I'm like, it's cause you don't know. I agree. I, what, there's a saying that goes with something like, you know, if you really know something, you can make it simple and anybody can understand when you explain it. It's not yeah. a good quote, yeah. but, um, I've made this mistake before of hiring somebody and not being stringent enough with their professionalism or their personality. And then ending up in a situation where I'm in conflict constantly. And personally, I don't want to be, you know, I want to be like, yeah. Hey, can you fix this? Hey, can you do this for us? And then the person's like, no, or here's why I did it. You know, I, I'm sure you've given feedback before where the person becomes defensive, you know, mm -hmm. Um, you know, you're like, oh, can you change this? And they're like, well, you know, I did it because this is how I learned it. Or I did it because I thought it would be better. And so like, and then they are just defensive. And now you got yourself into an argument. Yeah. That yeah. lasts like 15 minutes compared to five seconds that it should have been just like, okay. <laughs> you oh know? man. Yeah. I've, I've been in that situation as well. So I remember, uh, I, you know, oh, man, it's, I want a lot of our friends in college to, to watch this podcast. So I don't want to name names and I don't oh, want no, to do any of that stuff. Names. But, but, uh, you know, I've seen it done well and I've seen it done poorly. Uh, I've seen some, you know, I've seen leads be like, Hey, uh, you know, you know, what's going on, what's going on with this character design, you know? And then, you know, they, the, the younger artist is like, well, I wanted to do this and I wanted to do, do this. And then the lead goes, well, I really like it like this. And then the younger artist goes, yeah, well, you know, I, I think I like it like this. And then lead goes, mm, make it like I want it. And then just leaves, you know, mm -hmm. like make it like that, you know, it's almost like the office, you know, like make it blue and then leaves, <laughs> um, you know, in, in, in they don't want to hear it. La, 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 do what I want. Uh, and then, you know, I was just like, and then I just, and I'm in the room with the younger artists because I was one of the younger artists at the time. And they're just like pissed off. They're just like, oh, you know, this guy. Uh. And I'm just like, hmm, that's probably not how to do it. Um, and then, you know, as, as I moved into lead positions and art director positions, and a, a lot of times, if you're, if you move into those positions, you'll be given a team that you did not pick. Okay. You'll be given people that you didn't hire. It's like, Hey, you're the new art director. Here's a team that existed before you. And you're like the new art dad or art mom, you know, like, like figure it out. And it's like, okay. And so you'll go to someone and you'll be like, you know, why did you do it this way? And they'll say, and they're going to instantly you know, well, I did it this way because, you know, uh, I, you know, I read an article, uh, on 80 level that said that, you know, you have to do it this way. Or I don't even know 80 level. I, I think they're super fun. I don't know why I'm using it. But like they, they see something on the internet and they think they have to do it that way now. And it's like, well, yeah, that works for that thing, but not for our game. Right. And it's like, what, what do you, and, and so it's a it's difficult someone. line, right. To cross. Yeah. It, 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 and, and I think that it, it really does take a little more patience, especially if you didn't hire the person. Right. And if they, and, and, and my, my, my metric is I will be very kind and very patient and I'll be like, you know, why did you do that? Well, you know, why do you, do you like that? Like, what do you like about that? You know, well, is there a way we can get that that fits for what we're trying to do. You know what I mean? I'm always trying to find that middle ground because I don't, I want their, I want them to be heard and I want them to feel autonomy to make choices because if you're micromanaging people, they won't be creative. You, they have to have room to create. They have to have room to say, I made decisions on my own. And so my big thing is getting them to make the right decisions on their own because <laughs> they understand the rubric by which we're all working. We're all you know, aligned, whatever. We're all aligned to the same quality bar or, or the same uh, criteria. And so it's like, I just have to rearticulate the criteria of, of why this won't work and then let them creatively solve it for, for themselves, maybe give them some suggestions or whatever. Now, I, I will say that that's, but that's about the limit, right? Like I'll do that maybe once or twice. <laughs> 
And then by the third time, I'm like, dude, we've told you, like, we've told you this isn't going to work. And that's when I'm kind of like, I start souring on a person mm. kind of start, I start building, I start building in my head, this like, you know, psychic image of this person is hard to work with. Uh, you know, <laughs> cause like they're, <laughs> I understand. Yeah. I, all, um, hard to work with. Ah. <laughs> no, I want to clarify like a little bit of the situations, for example, like I, I don't just walk in there and I'm like, do it my way. You know, like I, I, I never like that again. I don't want conflict. I don't want problems normally. Um, example, I was working with somebody and I was trying to get them to do, um, something with more detail because they, it seemed like they had you know, save, let's just put it nicely, saved a lot of time on the task, perhaps more time than should be saved, aka half-assed it, okay? So, yeah, oh yeah. and so I'm trying to explain like, hey, like we need you to like follow through these certain steps in order for this to be considered done. And this person literally turns to me and goes, um, well, I read that it's, it's better this way. And like practically starts walking away. You know, and I'm like, this task is simply not finished. It's really not finished. And so like, now you got to sit them down. You got to bring them back, sit them down, explain what you expect, listen to them, defend themselves, you know, and then it becomes this ordeal. I don't know if you ever had that before. Like, it's not like even just art direction. It's like, Hey, in order for you to like export an FBX, you need to do these things or, you know, yep. even those basics. Yes. I, I, I even handle It's even like that at Marvel sometimes, you know, uh, you know, some, sometimes you'll, you'll be talking to, uh, you know, one of, uh, an art team or, or you'll see something that comes in and you'll, and, and they'll, 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 they wanted a certain, it just doesn't look right. You know, I, I won't use Marvel. We'll use like something from the past. Like, um, have you ever seen, have you ever had someone turn in a task half-assed uh, or, or, and they're consistently half-assing their assignments at work and yet their personal work is like amazing. Have you ever worked with anybody like that? I, that's the most frustrating to me because then I'm like, and I know if I never, I would never say this, but I'm like, do you even want to work here? Like your personal work is amazing, but you come to work and you're just like not doing it. And so I, I, I start weeding it out. I'm like, who's talking to you? Like who is not, because I, I like to assume the best, right? I, 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 I I want to assume the best. I'm like, who is not, why do you feel like you're an artist? I don't, you know, I won't say this like, but like, I'm, I'm trying to, to like to de deduce why you feel stunted at work, but at home you feel free. Why is your personal work so awesome, but your work here is like stunted. It's because, and it's, you know, and it's either you don't like working here. You're trying to do the bare minimum or you're afraid. You're maybe a little combination of all three. You're, 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 afr you're afraid to make decisions. And so you're not making any decisions. And so, um, honestly, uh, there's a quote that I like to use. I use it all the time. It's, it's probably, if anybody's ever listened to my, my previous podcast or interviews, I say it, it's like a, a rocket ship, you know, uses 90% of its fuel just to break orbit, maybe 80, I don't know that way, but it's, the most, the majority of its fuel is used to just break orbit. And then once it's in orbit, it uses like 10% to circle the earth, like however many times, right? And so a lot of times when building a new relationship, you have to use, uh, you, you need to have that excess of patience and kindness to build that trust. And then hopefully you can get into that orbit with somebody and develop a shorthand of trust, right? So, um, so what I'll do many, many times, and this is mostly what I do in Marvel too, is, is help develop relationships of trust with all these studios that we work with um paint over enter the paint over right the, the the bread and butter of any art director and it can range from hey i literally just painted this for you do it like this to just green circles and x's and like, <laughs> right? like, like that's like that's like more like high level like they get it like this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong i'm like oh, okay i get it um but there have been times when i've had to literally do the task to like 70%, 80% for them. Uh, and some art people listening are watching this maybe like, I would never, like, why would you ever go to those lengths? Well, good artists are hard to find. And I, I don't do this for everybody. I do it for people that I think are, are worth it. I think, uh, you know, that people that have, that I like, or I think are bringing something 
culturally to the team and they're just struggling, like a, like someone new, right? Or someone that I'm just trying to build trust with so they understand how I, I see this. Because we're all visual people. If I just sit there and be like, oh, make this 20% smaller and this 10% and this 10.5, like they won't get it. So a simple paint over of how I think it should be and what I'm trying to say usually does the trick. But then I'm like, please don't just steal this and submit this. Like do it, I need you to replicate this so that's in, you know, don't do, don't turn in your homework with my handwriting, right? Mm -hmm. Like do your own homework, right? But this is what I'm looking for. And once they understand that, they're like, oh, this is what you're looking for. Usually if, if, if they're eager and, and they are seeking that, like, like that approval goes a long way, right? We're like artistic people. We crave validation and approval. Like, so like the minute they do that, I'm like, yes, that's the one. They're like, oh, okay. And then they do it again. And then they do it again. And it's just that pattern of, of positive reinforcement. Um, and it is, it takes time and it takes effort. But eventually, my opinion, the sign of a good leader is you don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> like, 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 what do you do? It's like, I just make sure like the shit doesn't hit the fan and I've trained everybody so that it never does. And then it's like, it's easy. But at first it's really hard. At first you have to, you have to really get everybody uh, on the same page so they understand. And then that's a well-functioning team, you know? And, and now the leader or, or the manager or whatever can be off thinking about the next thing. I'm not in the weeds giving paint overs to everything that's due this milestone. I'm actually two milestones ahead thinking about what we should make and why we should make it versus how to make it and who should make it, right? So, um, yeah, so I, I, the, the, the power of the paint over is, <laughs> is kind of where I shine. And I think it's, it's a valuable tool. So what are some deal breakers and red flags when you're hiring new people? Just list. Uh, um, I, so automatic red flags are any of like the isms, right? Racism. Uh, sexism, um, you know, a, 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 any, and you have to be, you have to have a discerning eye, you know, like you said, tone. And I, I just think like any tone of, of any tone of disrespect, any tone of arrogance, uh, any tone of dismissiveness or non-inclusivity, uh, you know, you would think that that wouldn't happen, but yes, people, people do that stuff. Like, especially in interviews, like they'll let it, they'll let it slip or something. Um, so yeah, so that's like immediate red flag. No. Right. Um, I think that, uh, th you know, th those are the real, those are the, the real, real red flags. Um, because you just can't work in, in, in a creative industry, uh, holding any kind of view like that. You know, you have to, you have to have views that are inclusive, that are diverse, um, because you're going to be working with diverse people. You know, uh, so that's that's the first super red flag. Um, other red flags are uh, disrespect towards other other disciplines. You know, if we catch them saying things like like this QA department, right? Like f them. Like one time, these stupid QA people or my stupid producer. It's like like telling. I, I think there there's a way to tell a war story that you've been through, through, through some shit without um, throwing people under the bus, right? Like there's a way to, to, to do that without uh, um, throwing an entire discipline under the bus or, you know, I, I'm looking for those signs of negativity. I'm looking for signs of narcissism. I'm looking for signs of, uh, you know, uh, ego. Um, so, you know, th those are, those are, I think nar being narcissistic is like the, the, the telltale sign. I don't want to be like a, you know, I think it, it, it helps to know a little bit about those psych psychological tells, especially during like an interview. Um, because, uh, because yeah, I mean, I've worked with, I've worked with, uh, narcissists, I've worked with egomaniacs and it's, 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 it's horrible. It ruins your, it could ruin your week. It could ruin your year. You will hate working the whole time you're there. <laughs> yeah. The whole time you're there. I can think of a studio that I shall not name that there was one guy that just made my life miserable and I hated him. And I, I had to vent, you know, I had to vent. And so I vent to my friends and they all felt the same way, but we couldn't do anything because this particular individual was a sycophant, you know, uh, mm. was like, was like, was a kiss up. And so, People above us, the, they thought he was a great guy. But they didn't see all the manipulation that he did. 
uh, and he was just a manipulator and he was a narcissist. And eventually he had won the game where going after him was more trouble than it was worth. Yeah. And so all we could do was rise up. Like all we could do was kick ass at our job so that our voice held equal weight to his. And eventually that's what happened. But it took some time, man. Some guys, you know, some people are just really good at talking the talk so well that people just become hypnotized. And they're like, I think this guy knows what he's talking about, man. <laughs> you know, even though they haven't done shit. Right. Like, so uh, that's the kind of person I'm looking out for. So. so so what are some of the telltale signs of a narcissist during an interview? Do you have any examples? Um, you know, I, 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 me, me, me. Uh, when I did this, when my game, uh, you know, especially when it's like a huge, like my game, God of War, Ragnarok, right? It's like <laughs> your game, <laughs> you know, uh, a little bit of humility goes a long way, you know, um, you know, try, try to get them to tell like stories again, like that's like, like, Hey, tell, tell me about a time you did conflict, right? You, you, there was conflict resolution. Sometimes like a narcissist will, 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 it'll sound like too fantastical it'll be like and i magically through the power of my charisma got everybody to 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 make peace you know and it's like if it's it's if it sounds more realistic it's it's gonna be see the narcissists are like listening to this right now they're like oh okay so that's how i make my lives more believable it's like it's gotta have that 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 you know it, that that nitty-gritty like that emotion to it you know it's like dude every it's usually a, a conflict resolution story is usually if somebody can see both, like a good one is when they see both sides and they're able to come to a compromise. A bad one that a narcissist would tell is like, I beat them into submission or I used my, my cunning to trick them. And, uh, you know, I, I used the power of my personality to, to sway them to my point of view versus uh, seeing both sides and trying to find out what the other side is truly trying to say and seeing how and helping it fit into the uh into the equation or explaining to them you know that it's not a bad idea it just doesn't fit into the equation and x y and z would need to happen for their idea to fit into the equation and like that's that's a good conflict resolution story um stuff like that i'm trying to think of other ones but i'm sure there are <laughs> uh one time uh, there was this one thing that an applicant said that i didn't like but i've looked at at like how to do interview sites, you know, like how to score your job at this interview. And they recommend saying this. So I wanted to get your opinion on it. It's like this person stood, they were getting introduced. They were doing like the walk around, you know, they, they stood right in the middle of the room of all the 3d artists and technical artists. Mm -hmm. Um, and they out loud go to the guy who was interviewing them. I don't think I was super active in this interview. I was still like beginning, you know, and they go, so what's the problem here that you want me to fix? You know, and I remember looking at the other artists and we all looked at each other and we we're like, we didn't like the way that was worded or said, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> ah, that's, that's kind of a yikes, right? Like, like did they, they, sh they just like came up to someone just randomly and they're like, no, it's the like doing? the interviewer was giving them a tour and uh -huh. they came into our room, which is where this person would be working, you know? And that's when they said it out loud, like to the interviewer in front of us. Yikes. We were all standing oh, in a circle. Oh, get in. Yeah. yeah. And you guys are all like, they're, this person's, they're hiring people to fix us. What? No. And then the interviewer was like, the interviewer thought it was the most awkward thing in the world, you know? Oh my God. And we were all yeah. like, 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 what do you, like, how do you answer that question? Yeah. It's like walking into a room and it's like, all right, which one of these persons did you want me to fire? Like, who's, <laughs> who's on the shit list? Just so I know, you know what I mean? It's like, whoa, whoa, pump the brakes, buddy. <laughs> Hold yeah, them. stuff like that. They did not yeah, get the job specifically yeah. because of that, because we didn't yeah. like that. And then like, looking you know. For, looking for tact. Like, yeah, you're looking for that tact. You know, maybe you are. Maybe we are hiring for someone who has to do a dirty job. You know, maybe we are hiring for someone who is going to have to make some tough calls, right? You don't want someone like that. It was just an someone... artist position too. <laughs> <laughs> what a dork. Like what? He was, he was going to be our peer. So uh, like, yeah. like, yeah. okay, what do you want the interviewer to say? <laughs> like yeah, Anna right here, she's got an attitude problem. This guy, he drinks. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Say? This guy smells funny. Look at this guy. <laughs> just look at him. Why is he here? Uh, yeah, that's, that's not cool. Um, I'm trying to think like, yeah, but I think people, I don't know. This is just a preference. Like a, a, 
And a lot of the things that I look for are maybe just preferences too. Like there's never, you know, like I like people who are a little humble. I like people who share the same values as me, if, if I'm being frank. And when I say share the same values, it's, it's not something like, I'm not talking about political. I'm not talking like, you know, like the, I'm, I'm talking about the, the values of creativity, right? Like, like I like people who are, who are into things, who are curious about things, who, who learn about things. Like if, if, if we're hiring for an artist position and then, you know, they also like bake bread. Right. And I, I'm like, and they, and they can talk to me about baking bread, but then they can like turn it back into like why that like helped them learn Houdini. I'm like, Ooh, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Uh, like I want, I want people, I want curious minds and I want people, um, and I like people who ask questions back at me. I like people who are, who, 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 uh, you know, who can throw it back, uh, you know, you know, I'll say, you know, so why do you want to work here? And I'll be like, well, why do you like working there? You know, it's like, oh, oh okay. Like we get that whole back and forth spicy, get back and forth because that's part of the creative process is, is, is being curious, having, uh, having a, um, a good dialogue, a good communication style and, and not taking it personal, you know, like there's problems that there are problems that need to get solved. But and things might get heated because you're passionate, right? Like, but like, and and being passionate just means you care. Like you 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 care to that level. Um, but there's a limit. There's a limit to uh, how passionate you should be, uh, in my opinion. And that limit is you are you are a passionate to the point where it's out of your subject matter expertise. It was like I'm passionate about this gameplay thing. I really want this gameplay thing to happen. And I'm going to sit there and argue and argue and argue with the gameplay director. I'm going to be looking like an asshole eventually. And he's going to be like, I'm tired of having this conversation with you, Josh. Same thing with art. It's like someone on, uh, you know, s someone has a specific idea. They really want this character to look like their waifu or whatever. And it's like, no. <laughs> I've gone through that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exact like, scenario. I know. It's like, no, 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 no. I'm tired of having this conversation. We're done. Um, because I'm the subject matter expert in this particular thing. And, and I think that that's, you know, you have to have that respect. You have to have that respect of accountability. It's like, you can be passionate about things that you're not accountable for to an extent, because at the end of the day, the team or individual that has accountability for that aspect of the game is the one who's going to have to uh, sort of justify it or, um, you know, receive the accolades or take the heat. You know, mm -hmm. you have to let people make those yeah. decisions. You have to respect that process. So, so what's the best advice you ever got in your career? The best advice I ever got in my career. Yeah. I've gotten so much advice in my career. Uh, dang. I've gotten so many pieces of advice. She's like top three. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't really say I've gotten like advice, like Josh, you should do this, right? Or Josh, this is the secret or Josh, I've gotten pieces of uh, observational advice from like superior, from like art directors who are over me um, that didn't make sense at the time and act and be, made sense later on. Um, one of the best pieces of advice or feedback that I got was when I could, I wanted to be an art director at Riot I, or a lead, but I was just a senior character artist. And what Riot does is they, they've decoupled, I don't know if this is anymore, but when I was there, they decoupled your salary from your title. So you could be making a ton of money as a senior character artist, right? You could be making like near, you know, art director-ish or lead-ish at other studios as a senior because they wanted to know you were appreciated. You know, they, they wanted you to know, like, that's like one of the main levers in capitalism is like, let you know you're appreciated. Here's some money. So Riot was really good when I was there at, at doing that. But I wanted more. I wanted to be an art director or a lead. I wanted to uh, enter the people side of the equation. I wanted to help artists be better artists. I just didn't want to make better skins and better characters. I wanted to help make better artists. They didn't want to do that. They were like, Josh, no. And I would harp on this in my one-on-ones. And then... One of my art directors said, Josh, if we make you a lead uh, or an art director, we'll have a bunch of Joshes running around the studio. 
we'll have a bunch of Josh's at Riot. And I was like, what's the problem with that? Like, you'll have a bunch of badass dudes who make kick-ass characters. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I didn't understand, like, what he meant was we'll have a bunch of uh, arrogant, entitled, <laughs> good-natured, uh, good-natured, yet somewhat uh somewhat arrogant and 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 bullish people because because what he was trying to say and i, I wish in, in 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 hindsight i wish it would have been more more obvious because i could take it you know but you never know you never know if someone can take really harsh feedback but i could have that you know having more of me would not be good you know having more of josh is it's too spicy for mm -hmm. the, the stew that is for the you know the recipe that is the the the, the riot games art team uh, it's only upon hindsight as i became an art director that i realized that that kind of person you don't want a lot of and it was someone who's in a meeting their i their idea is always right or they're always vying for this thing or they're 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 not letting anyone else uh speak their piece you know um and always have to have the answer like i would get feedback like josh just let the room breathe man like everybody knows you're great everybody knows that you're kick-ass you don't have to talk try not try <laughs> not talking have you tried <laughs> shutting up have, have you, yeah kind of right it was kind of like have you tried just not talking <laughs> right like you don't have to prove yourself especially as i became an art director at other studios they're like josh you don't have to prove yourself like just let it just let the topic breathe let people think just because it's quiet doesn't mean that it's bad Mm -hmm. We all know that you have an opinion. Let someone else, let someone else, let, let's let someone else talk. And that's something that was like, wow, I should do that because, and it's something I do. I actually, I still have that problem. I do talk a lot. Uh, <laughs> this podcast is evidence of that, mm -hmm. but, but, um, you know, especially in a group setting, you know, in a zoom call, I have opinions, you know, like we'll be in a, a zoom call with, you know, a really high profile partner. Uh, and I have opinions, but it's like, Let's just let's just let's just see what shakes loose. And there'll be time after. There'll be time after to give my opinion. But many times someone else will say it. And one of the big breakthroughs for me was knowing that I didn't have to say it. Like my me having not like I'm trusted enough on the team so that I can feel like I don't have to say it to have to feel validated. Does that make sense? Yeah. And um, that's a big step, like especially when as an artist, your you feel as though your contribution is the art. Well, then as you become a lead and you do less art, you feel like your contribution is your comments in a meeting or your, uh, you know, your ideas uh, in, a, in a setting. And if you didn't give a good idea, you're not doing your job. Um, but then I think the biggest of brains is let other people figuring it out for themselves, which looks like you're doing nothing, but in fact, you're doing a lot because it's this weird invisible work where you are helping people come to these conclusions on their own and thus helping them make better decisions going forward. Um, and some of it's not done in the Zoom meeting. It's done in DMs after the meeting. Uh, it's done in one-on-ones. It's done in uh, just planting these these seeds asking questions it's not sometimes it's not giving the answer it's asking the question you already know the answer and you just are you know a good option for the answer and you you ask the question to see if every anybody else uh, if the if the group will get there with you or maybe they'll come up with something better you know i think that's like the that's the biggest of brains which on the surface looks like you're asking questions which day one would be like you should know this. You know what I mean? It's like asking mm. questions is the biggest no-no for a for a for someone new who's insecure. It's like I can't ask questions. I have to have answers. Mm -hmm. But that's the irony. So true. Yeah. For me, the hallmarks of a good leader. I I got really lucky. My third, second or third boss in the industry was probably the best leader I have ever dealt with ever. Like, I'm even gonna shout him out. It was Chris. It was so good, okay? And to me, the hallmarks of the best leader are somebody who has no ego, they have nothing to prove, like you've mentioned a bunch of times, right? Uh, he, he didn't need to be the smartest in the room. He didn't need to be the, the most uh, powerful in the room even. 
somebody who listens and asks questions because even as the leader there you're not like pounding the ground like they say you know like uh, every day you don't, you don't necessarily know the nitty-gritty of what's going on because you know it's not your job to know that you know so the giving the people who are actually doing it a chance to speak and a chance to like show their expertise and give their opinion that is a fantastic quality in a leader um last you know oh, and just somebody who's respectful he was so wonderful <laughs> uh this reminds me of something i read in this book wait it's literally right here i have like 45 books right off screen the personal MBA. And there's a chapter in here called absence blindness. Have you ever heard of that phrase? Oh, I, I stopped hearing you. So that's, that's yeah. absence blindness. What's absence no, blindness. Heard of, what, what is absence blindness? So absence blindness is a, is a concept of basically you don't know what you don't see. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You can't even fathom it because you don't see it. And it's, it's something that plagues good leaders. And you were saying sometimes when you're trying to be not domineering in meetings and you're trying to be a good leader, you stay quiet in meetings, you do the invisible work, right? So a lot of times bosses that don't do that, the bosses that cause problems just to fix them sometimes, they are the ones that get the most accolades. You know, here's how I solved this horrible problem. You know, ah, I deserve all the flowers in the world. Guess what? Maybe he caused it or she, yeah. right? Yeah. Have you ever worked with people like that? I have. Okay. okay. Uh, so they'll cause problems to fix them. And it's loud. It's visible. It's in your face, you know, and everybody's like, oh, wow, this person's getting a lot done. I wonder what Josh is doing on his team. I haven't heard a peep from his yeah. team yeah. in years. Uh, uh, it must be so easy doing Josh's job because, you know, his team doesn't cause any problems. Yeah. But you're doing all the invisible work that goes sometimes unnoticed and doesn't get the yeah. same laurels. And it's like, not everybody appreciates that. The, the yeah. good, the good, the good higher, higher ups recognize yep. it. Yes. You know, I was, I was going to say that's exactly right. Like if you work at a place where they only respect you, if you are, uh, you know, if they only respect you as a leader, if you're fixing problems and they don't respect you as a leader, because there's no problems to solve, that's a red flag that you should probably question whether you should be there or not. Because if it's like, it's like having a, it's like being in a relationship, right? It, you know, if you ever had a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend and uh, you you pick fights so that you can make up, right? It's that volatile, yeah. it's that volatile thing. You, you, you make, you saw you, you cause problems so you can solve the problem and then you make another problem so you can solve the problem You're the hero. versus versus a happy relationship is really just like we're just chilling we're just chilling at a high level every like we're solving problems together come what may problems not of our doing but problems the kind of problems that come with growth not the kind of problems that come from incompetence or uh or or, or toxic you know being volatile yeah. and so if you have if there's leadership there that can't recognize steady a steady hand and they only react to the the Superman syndrome, right? Like, you know, the leaders, uh, the the leaders who who are putting out fires versus the leaders who never cause a fire to begin with. Like, that's that's a that's a leadership that you should that's a leadership uh, group that you probably want to get away from, because uh, that's a toxic that's a very toxic uh, thing to be in. You, you're looking you're looking for for executives, CEO, you know, C suite executives who respect the kind of leadership that doesn't cause fires in the first place. And like I said, that's like you said, that's done in that invisible work. There might've been fires that no one saw, you yeah. know, there, and, and, um, and, you know, that, that, that's, that's, that's something I had to learn, you know? And, and so that to your original question, what's the best piece of advice that I ever got eventually led me to this, right? Like, like it, it got me on that leadership, sort of like discipline train because it is it is its own discipline it's not like it's like zbrush it's like it's like drawing it's like painting it's 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 its own set of techniques and um sort of repetitive thought processes uh and and, and headspace to get you in what a good leader should be um and you know we've all worked at places where they didn't let us be good artists. You know, there are places that won't let you be a good leader either. It's the same thing. So, um, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I work at a place that won't let me be a good artist. Like they wouldn't let you flex your muscles and really like improve because they were afraid. They were afraid that you would mess it up, you know? So you just like end up being mediocre and then you get out because you're like, oh, I can't flex my artistic muscles. This happened to me a lot of times. Um, so yeah, leadership, same thing. It's like, they won't let you lead. So you go somewhere else where you can flex those muscles. I have audience questions, like just to wrap up this person asks, so this is Skyless canvas on Instagram. They ask, what can we do to grow our skills fast and effectively? I think it's different for everybody, but I think a tried and true method is just like in painting master studies, you know, uh, They'll say, oh, that's copying. Are you just tracing? Tracing helped me learn how to draw. Like I traced comic books to learn how Jim Lee does stuff, to learn how these amazing comic book artists do, did stuff. And once I learned, I did it. So one of the first things I think people should do is pick a concept, pick something they're passionate about, and just make it almost like a model. When it comes to 3D, I treated it like a model kit. I used to do a lot of models when I was little, like airplane models and car models and stuff like that. And I'd be like, okay, this is my project. I'm going to make a Ninja Turtle. Uh, like, well, what do I want to learn, right? Like, what what do you want to learn? Do you want to learn? Because that takes some research. And and, and, it, and and what you want becomes more refined the further you go. At first, you might just say, I want to make a model. Okay, great. great. Just want to make a model. After that, you're going to be like, I want to make a good model. All right, I want to make a good model. What, is, what makes a good model? Okay, well, now you're getting more specific. A good model means good topology, means good textures, means good bakes, means... And then... You'll make a good model and you'd be like, oh, why does it suck? Well, because I don't know how to pose. So I, oh, okay, now I'm going to make a really good model. I'm going to pose it awesome. Uh, and now I'm going to light it awesome. And now I'm going to display it awesome. And so you go down these steps. So long story short, how do, you, how do you most effectively do it? Give yourself meaningful projects and, and try to see them through. Don't be too hard on yourself. If you quit, just start another one. Because sometimes I lose interest in my own personal projects too. But always keep that here always gear your projects to something that will make you a better artist if it's fan art if it's whatever the subject matter doesn't matter it could be a race car it could be whatever you're passionate about as long as it's pushing you to research an aspect that you didn't know before and then you can apply that to the next thing um and so that's what i think is i i, I treated everything as a, a project to learn it's like i want to learn hair i want to learn armor i want to make i want to make skin like this i want to make a robot like this and i was not always successful but then learning what's horrible about your art is is, is extremely valuable as, as executing well because learning it, it, being critical and being like oh i didn't quite nail it why didn't i nail it well that's when you can get a mentor it's like when you know something's wrong but you can't tell why why doesn't my model look like raf cassettes i did everything i did his tutorials i did everything why does mine look jank and his looks awesome that's when you get a mentor to help you walk through the time because it's really just a bunch of tiny things that that accumulate into a big thing right so first just start let's repeat over and over until eventually you hit your limit then get a mentor that would be my advice nice perfect <laughs> advice so we have to wrap up and thank you so much, Josh, for giving us so much of your background and your best tips and advice today, where we're going to be hearing from Josh a lot, of course, because he is the co-host of the podcast. Woo. Hey, hey, yeah. <laughs> Our next episode is going to be with Neville Page, uh, creature designer on Avatar and Avatar Way of Water and a bunch of other things. And also a judge on the TV show that you may have heard of Face Off. So stay tuned for that. And a special thank you to our, the sponsor of today's episode, Ringling College of Art and Design VR Department. Uh, thank you so much for that. And we will see you all in the next one. Oh, see. and make sure to follow, like, subscribe. Oh, like and subscribe. Yeah. Like and subscribe. We'll, we'll, we'll have our socials like on this too, right? We will. So, yeah, it'll be somewhere. Yeah.